Hey guys, this is Mr. Bennett. Uh, this is notes number 14. We're talking about passive transport. What I've done with these, this uh, video is I've split it up into three parts. Part 14A is going to talk about the cell membrane and solutions. Then you'll go on to part 14B, which is going to focus on passive transport and a process called diffusion. And then 14C, we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk specifically about osmosis. So the reason why I've done this is I want you to take a little break in between meaning stand up, stretch, make sure that you're able to focus on each video and you're not spending too much time sitting in front of the computer trying to focus on this stuff. Do really really short, meaning as long as each video segment is, times of focus, make sure you get it all, then take a break, then come back and focus again. Plus, later on if you need to go back and review something like osmosis, which typically is a kind of a tough topic, you can just go back to the osmosis video you don't have to watch this whole video over again or like fast forward or trying to figure out where it was. Okay, it'll just you just come back and watch that video. So, our first topic is the cell membrane. We've talked about the cell membrane in the past. Now, the term I want to introduce right now is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable, whoops, there we go. Semi-permeable means partially passable. In other words, this term describes exactly what we already know about the cell membrane. It has the ability to control what gets in or out. What we haven't talked about is how it does this. What about the cell membrane allows it to be semi-permeable? We have kind of alluded to it. We've kind of introduced the idea, but we really haven't explained the how. So what it all goes back to is last unit when we talked about phospholipids. The cell membrane is made up of phospholipids, but what we haven't gotten into is how these phospholipids arrange themselves in the cell membrane. It turns out that they form what's called a lipid bilayer. So bi means two or double. Okay. So in other words, we're forming a double layer of lipids. So what we've done here in this picture is they've taken the cell membrane and they've magnified it. So we could look at what the cell membrane is actually made up of. Well, it turns out it's made up of phospholipids. So here is a phospholipid. Okay, phospholipids, if we magnify one, as of last unit, we know that they contain two fatty acid tails. These guys are nonpolar, which means that they are water fearing, meaning they don't like to mix with water. In fact, they want to be as far away from water as possible. The other end of the molecule has a phosphate group, which is polar. What that means is it is water loving. It loves to mix with water. Okay it's going to try and get as close to water as possible. So when these guys line up like this, you can see there's a bunch of phospholipids and they're going off into the distance there. All these phospholipids lined up, what they've done is they've organized themselves so that all of their little phosphate heads, the polar ends, are facing the outside of the cell. And it turns out the outside of most cells have lots of water. So the phosphate groups are organizing themselves so that they're interacting with the water and they're actually blocking the nonpolar ends from any access to the water. So it kind of works, it's kind of good in two ways. The phosphate groups get to act, interact with water and, they, and they, they love that, right? They're water loving. And then our tails, the nonpolar tails, are getting pushed away from the water so they don't have to interact with water and they like that because they're water fearing. They don't want to interact with water. So it's kind of the perfect arrangement. Now on the other side of this bilayer, on the bottom side here, this would be the inside of the cell. And it turns out the inside of the cell also has a lot of water. So the arrangement flips. Now we have the phosphate groups, those polar heads, facing the inside of the cell. And again, their nonpolar tails are moving away from the watery environment towards the center of the membrane so that they don't have to interact with water at all. And what this ends up doing is it creates a polar outer layer for the membrane and a polar inner layer for the membrane. The central kind of core of the membrane is nonpolar. This is what creates the semi-permeability. Things that are really big are going to have a hard time getting through because all of these little phosphate groups are tightly packed. They're preventing water from getting in to mess around with these nonpolar tails. They're not 100% good at that, but they're trying anyhow. And so big objects, objects are going to have a hard time getting through. Also, anything that's polar, anything that has a charge, 
whether it's a positive charge or whether it's a negative charge. Anything that has a charge is also going to have a hard time getting through this membrane because you have these polar ends that would love to interact with it, but you have this really, really thick, double thick in fact, nonpolar layer. Remember, polar things do not mix well with nonpolar things. So it's semi permeable because big things and charged things are going to have a hard time getting through. Okay? And it's all because of this lipid bilayer, this arrangement. What I want you to do right now is I want you to look at this picture, okay? And I want you to draw your version of it in the box on your notes. So make sure that you draw the phospholipids in layers like this. Make sure you label the top layer as polar, the outer part of the cell membrane, and the inner layer of the inner surface of the membrane as polar as well, and make sure you label that nonpolar core for the membrane. Realize that this would go all the way out this way. It would just continue around. Okay, it's the this is the membrane. I'd also like you to label in your picture the outside environment. Make a note that it has lots of water in it, and the inside environment. Make a note it has lots of water in the environment. So if you haven't done this already, pause the video, draw your picture, and label it. All right, the last topic I want to cover in this first part of the video is the cytosol. We haven't really talked about this. We have talked a lot about the cytoplasm, but we haven't talked about the fluid or the liquid of the cytoplasm. So cytosol, this term, cyto, first of all, is referring to the cytoplasm. Sol is kind of short for solution. So cytosol is the solution or the liquid of the cytoplasm. Now let's talk about what a solution is. A solution is a solvent combined with a solute. Solvents are the substances that do the dissolving, meaning you have a greater amount of them. So you basically mix the solvent with the solute, and the solvent in a cell is typically water. Okay? Cells are basically bags of water. And so the water is the solvent, it does all the dissolving. Then we mix into it the solutes. The solutes are the substances that get dissolved. Generally, you have a lesser amount of them compared to the water. And there's lots and lots of different solutes in the cell. You have salts, sugars, proteins, steroids, uh, fatty acids, amino acids, uh, monosaccharides, polysaccharides, lots of different solutes that are in the cell. Now, if we want to describe the amount of solute that's in the cell, we call that a concentration. So concentration is just the amount of solute in the amount of water. So it's a number. Okay. What we really care about when we're talking about cell transport is we care about the concentration gradient. So if I draw a cell, right, and let's say that there's some ribosomes over here and they're making lots of proteins. Okay. So they've made a lot of proteins, lots and lots, okay, over in this area of the cell. We would say that there's a concentration gradient across the area, meaning inside the cell. Here, we have a high concentration of the protein. Over in this region, we have a low concentration of the protein. In fact, there's none of it, right? We have lots over here, we have a little, little, or in this case, none over here. So there's a difference in concentration across the area. We could also say that we have a difference in concentration across the membrane, or the barrier. We have a high concentration on this side, and on the outside of the cell, we have none of the protein. So there's a difference or concentration gradient across the membrane. All right, so that's the end of 14A. Take a little break, okay? Make sure you finish that picture, and then come back and watch 14B.